The Hunting of the Last Dragon by Cheryl Jordan Chapter 3 Greetings, Brother Benedict. Writing already, I see, and my day narrative not even begun. Ah, I can guess why. Yester eve the abbot asked me about the stuff called paper that the Chinese write upon, and I wondered how he heard of it. Now I remember that I mentioned paper to you yesterday afore you picked up your pen. While you unrolled the new parchment, I'll warn you told the abbot of it, and that now he thinks there might be another pearls of wisdom in these pleasantries of mine. I suppose he instructed you henceforth to write down every word. Tis a waste of good ink, brother. I swear I'll not drop any pearls until you hold your pen, ready and inked. What? Still writing away? It comes of swearing obedience to you, abbot. I suppose. Well then, without further ado, on with the tale. My father had told me to listen for news at Rokeby, though I had forgot his instructions. I did hear news as I was about to leave. I overheard two women speaking, and got the words, Burn to the ground! and pricked up my ears. Aye, one of the women was saying, her voice hushed. Everything was destroyed, they said. The whole of Wigland, the fields and all. Tis the beginning of the day of judgment for sure. Wigland? They spoke of Thornhill, surely. That was raised yesterday. I moved nearer and listened as they continued. Only the priest escaped, went on the first woman. He hid in the crypt beneath the church and came out three days later to find that all was ash and blackened stone. He ran all the way to the next town, arrived babbling like an idiot, his hair gone white overnight. He said he saw what did it, saw it coming, flying down from the sky with fire pouring. Hush, whispered her friend, glancing at the children gathered about their skirts. She added in a brighter tone, let's go and see the bear, Mary, mayhap they will bait it with a pack of hounds. That will cheer us up and entertain the little ones. They wandered off, leaving me disturbed, my new one joy gone down a notch or two. As I passed the last pavilion, the picture on it caught my eye. It was an evil image, a being half human, half animal, with outlandish scarlet robes, devilish slanting eyes, and tiny hooves. Craving distraction from the news I had heard, and not a little curious, I joined the line that was beginning to form outside. A brawny man was taking money as people filed in, and a lad stood beside him, shouting, See Lizzie Littlefeet, curiosity from the great empire of China. Discover heathen rituals, see foreign costumes of priceless silk, hear the mysterious language of Babel. Slowly we shuffled forward, one by one entering the dimness. I was one of the first in, so I got a good place again, right near the stage. Afore long the pavilion was near full, and there was a great deal of jostling and pushing behind me. Children were grizzling to be picked up so they could see. Though there was nothing yet to be seen, save an empty stage and a large bolted wooden box painted with hideous faces. The box was guarded by a man who was shortly joined by Tabalt himself. The swordsman recognized me and gave me a grin and a wink. Behind me, a boy asked if the freak was dangerous and whether he had two heads. I don't know, son, the lad's father replied, but she's a wicked heathen, so she'll have horns more like and hooved feet. Other people laughed, though there was little mirth in it. Then the pavilion entrance was closed, putting us all in darkness instantly. There was silence. Of a sudden I was afraid, thinking on another freak I had seen in another fair long ago when I was small. That freak had been hideously misshapen, his face disfigured beyond any semblance to a human being. And I had been in terror of him. Though he was heavily chained, could this monster be worse? A torch was set aflame, lighting the box and the faces of the men bending over it. People pressed forward, 
and I was crushed so hard against the stage I had to put my hands on the edge of it to brace myself. The faces of the painted box were so close I could have spat on them. The box was unbolted, the lid thrown back, ghost-like in its semi-darkness. A figure rose from within. It raised its arms. There was a shimmer of red silk, and the torch was passed quick beneath its face. The face was small, human, yet different. Only for a moment I saw it. Saw the alien brown features, goblin-like and freakish, with dusky wild hair and coal-black almond-shaped eyes. Then the torch was whipped away. Truth to tell, I was disappointed. Hardly a freak, this compared with the other I had seen. The person was lifted out and placed upright on the stage. Small it was, half lost within folds of scarlet silk, teetering like a child barely able to stand. Then it lifted its shining hem, and the torchlight passed close by its feet. They were small, far too small for human feet, and I thought they must be devil's hooves. Then the freak began to walk. Up and down the platform it walked, not quickly, but with tiny limping steps, as if its feet were chained closely together. Its head was bent, and its hands folded at its waist. I'd watched, appalled and entranced. Was it human? Or was it some alien half-thing? Unnatural and demonic. Just then, the freak stopped hobbling and turned to face us all. In the leaping flame light from the torch, I saw its face again, and realized with a start that it was a maid. Speak, O oh heathen one! commanded Tabalt, holding the torch flame by her head. For a moment, she hesitated, swaying as if her tiny feet were hardly able to support her, though she was slight enough to be blown away by the wind. Then she opened her mouth and chanted a bizarre little song, her voice high and lilting, making words as strange as spells. When she had finished, she very politely bowed low, People cheered and clapped, though I did not. I don't know what I felt. Fear? Or fascination? Or pity? She was like a changeling, a strange brown elf child, enchanting and fragile. Some of the people standing close called her a hobgoblin and spat at her. Tybalt commanded the freak to do something else, and she sat on a stool and took off her tiny shoes. Being close, I noticed that her fingernails were long and curved, like claws. Her feet were bandaged at another order from her keeper, and with the torch held close to her, she removed the bindings. Her feet were grotesque, misshapen, clumps with the toes and heels curved down and inwards, almost touching underneath, and they were flat shapeless, as if the bones had all been broke. They've been bound up like that since she were a little child, announced Tabalt. That's what they do in the barbarian land she's from. It's to keep the women in their place, you see. To stop them a-wondering and gossiping and getting up to mischief. A very sensible custom we would do well to take on here. Some of the men chuckled shouting agreement, and their wives scolded them. That fine garment she wears, Tabalt went on, it's silk, made from worms. People roared with laughter and disbelief. True, he cried, smiling a little. You've heard of the east, of the Silk Road, of old Cathway, and the Orient, land of silk and fabulous furs? Well, that's where she's from, China. She's an Easterling. Our kings and queens wear purple finery, brought along that famous silk road from her far land. And more than silk is brought. Fine treasures, idols of silver and gold, and all manners of jewels. A long way she comes, this barbarian maid to entertain and educate you gentlefolks. Heathen she is, praise to golden idols and devils and all things wicked and forbidden. Her people are uncivilized, backward. 
They live in ignorance and heinous sin. You'll never see the likes of her anywhere else in our land. So look well. Several people made the sign of the cross, doubtless fearing that the very presence of the heathen maid might breathe evil over them. An echo of my grandfather's ravings came to me, something about the Black Death coming from the east, filling the sky with fire and blowing to England on evil winds. Had she seen the fire, this tiny freak? Is that why her eyes were narrowed and slanted? To shut out the light and the heat from the fiery skies? How did you come by her? called out a woman. Well, that'd be telling a great secret, said the bald. But you may be sure she's rare and precious. Other questions were asked. Not all answered. During them, the maid remained very still, her hands folded in her lap, her small, strange face uplifted. Around me, people began to leave. Tabalt departed, doubtless, to his own tent, for another breathtaking performance with his sword. Leaving the other man to stand guard, I stayed, I know not why, looking at the freakish girl upon the stool. Slowly she bent and bound the linen strips about her feet again, then pulled on her tiny shoes. When she raised her head, I alone was left. As her gaze met mine, her lofty look disappeared, and to my surprise, she smiled. You let Tabalt play his sword about you, she said. Her soft voice was mildly accented. Her words and the expression on her face startled me. How did you know? I asked. It felt odd, exchanging words with her. Your hair, she said. Ah, I touched the top of my head, feeling the bristles. Well, tongue-tied again, as always with a maid, even a freakish one. He has done that but a few times before, she said. Done what? I asked. Shaved off hair. Most people tremble so. He dares not do it. You must have been right brave. Not brave, I said, and felt my face grew hot. Scared stiff, more like. Again she smiled. Then her guard roughly picked her up and carried her out in exit at the back of the tent. As they went outside, I glimpsed a cage with a dark grey canvas across the top. I was left alone in the silence. A strange feeling fell on me. I cannot say twas fate or a foreshadowing, but it was something akin to it. I felt that we should meet again. Do you need rest, brother? You yawn. A yawn brought on by the evening's warmth and the med. I hope. And not because my tale is dull, I thought that I was getting into the swing of it quite well. Ah, I just noticed your candles are nearly burned out. We'll continue after dinner on the morrow, and I'll tell you what I found when I went home.